Live at five from RT International, headlining today a former interpreter for the British Army in Afghanistan who has refused asylum by the UK despite being hunted by the Taliban, has reportedly been killed in Iran. Coming up too, as Islamic State seeks to expand its reach, a Russian family is desperate to find their son amid growing fears he's been recruited by the terrorists. His parents share their heart-rending story with RT. And Bangkok is shaken by another blast following Monday's deadly explosion. This hour, we look at how terrorists are increasingly targeting tourists around the world. Hello, very good afternoon from me, Kevin Owen, here at RTHQ in Moscow today, where I say it's just turned uh, 5 p.m. now, and our top story we're following up, a former interpreter for the British Army in Afghanistan has reportedly been killed after fleeing from the Taliban. The Afghan man had tried to make it to Europe on his own after saying that he felt abandoned by his ex-employers. Let's cross to London. Our correspondent, Harry Feard, across this story today. Harry, very unfortunate, extremely sad outcome for this guy, yeah? Indeed, sad news for those of, our, those of us who have been following the fate of these, uh, this unique group, indeed, of Afghans who worked for the Western forces occupying their homeland. The Afghan military interpreter Ahmadullah Popal, as he's known, has apparently been tortured and killed in neighboring Iran. He was desperate enough, fleeing the Taliban, to pay smugglers to get him into the neighboring country. It's not clear who exactly was responsible for his torture and murder yet. But we do know that he faced death threats from the Taliban, having worked for the British Army as an interpreter. However, he was denied refuge by the UK state and denied security assistance by the British Army that he risked his life to serve. Now, one of RT's Afghan contacts, another former British military interpreter, so to speak, well, he's told us today that friends of Popal are confirming their friend's death. Listen to what he told us. Uh, he was caught and killed. Uh, now, specifically, who killed him? Uh, we cannot pinpoint somebody, uh, but uh, as uh, the British interpreters are potential targets to anybody, anybody could have found out that uh, he, he used to be a British interpreter and could have killed him. It could be Iranian government, Taliban, somebody. He has died as a result of his uh, direct work for the British forces. Well, the Taliban risk that Popal faced, of course, was not unique. There are thousands of such Afghans who have faced this dire risk to their life from the Taliban. And they've accused the UK state of no less than abandoning them in their homeland. Now, arty has been in touch with several of these guys over the last couple of years. And they've been telling us how the Taliban has called for their execution. They call them Western spies and collaborators for having worked for the British and American forces there. And they've run a vicious campaign to intimidate and do as much harm to them as possible. They face assassination and death threats even pinned to their front doors. And also, most cruelly, the targeting and killing of their family members too. And it's that kind of brutality that Popal was apparently trying to desperately escape. We understand he was trying to complete the route that so many have tried to from Afghanistan into Iran and then from Iran into Turkey and then on to mainland Europe to try and find safety away from their homeland, a country now ever insecure and unstable. Harry Fear in London, thank you for that uh, update there. Well, as Harry was saying there, the Taliban accuses former Afghan interpreters who worked for the UK of collaborating with the enemy, therefore. It's believed that hundreds of people have been currently hunted down by the group. Despite rejecting the pleas for asylum from dozens of Afghans, the British government's stance is that it maintains its policy as, quote, legal, honourable and fair. That's according to the country's Ministry of Defence that claims it provides Afghans with support that reflects the risks they took. 
Well, Archie's been following the story of uh, another former interpreter for the British Army. He applied for a UK visa, but says that the procedure takes so long that he couldn't wait in Afghanistan from where he fled after receiving death threats from the Taliban. After travelling for nine months, he's now stuck in the French port city of Calais, trying to get to the UK illegally. I face a lot of big risk in my life. I have to face this one as well. The rule of the uh, UK is a little bit like complicated, like a little bit difficult, and that's taking time taking one and a half year or nearly one year, but uh, I couldn't pass that time in Afghanistan, in Kabul, I couldn't wait. I have to cross this channel because I don't have another option and I have to go to UK. This is my last option. I have to wait, wait, wait. I have to cross this channel. He, he completely conforms to all the criteria, but this system has been correctly described as being Kafkaesque. When we jump on the top of the net, we're gonna wear this one for my cover on skin or my black. We will try again, we will we, be continuing until we succeed. The effectiveness of Islamic State's recruitment drives become a major concern of late. A recent UN report says 25,000 people from around the world have now travelled to fight for the jihadists. But ISIL wants more. It's uh, thought the terrorist organisation is now expanding its propaganda campaign then to target more countries. Apart from the Middle East and Europe, the jihadists want to recruit people from the Caucasus, from Central Asia and also from Indonesia. And also on ISIL's list is Russia where one family is now desperately searching for their son, who it's feared has joined the extremists. He disappeared on holiday with his wife and baby daughter. Artizili Petrenka met his parents. It's understandable how painful it is for their parents. They thought that their son, along with his wife and baby daughter, mm. were just sunbathing somewhere on the beaches of southern Russia. Uh, however, only by the difference in phone tones when they dialed his number, they were able to realize that he actually crossed the border and they later found out that he took a plane to Istanbul and that's where he disappeared. They tried to reach him by phone for a month. They couldn't do that, but he sent uh, text messages to his friends saying that they should stop looking for him because he left to study the Quran. And as a last resort, these people uh, tried to use our camera to send a mm -hmm. message to their son and that's when emotions understandably started running high. Я хочу обратиться к своему сыну в стену, что я виноват перед тобой, сын. Надо было быть приходить вместе с тобой в мечеть и служить собой, сынок, что что тебе говорят эти люди? Надо было спать вместе с тобой, когда ты спал в этой мечети. Извини меня. Мы всегда тебя ждём. И будем всегда тебя искать. Всю жизнь. Сколько мне Аллах дал, я проживу. Но то, что мне Он дал, я потрачу на твой поиск. Эли, were there any indications, um, according to the parents, that their son was was turning down to a fundamental route? Well, you see, after all these sobs, it was quite tough to get frank answers on the things that they missed and failed to notice about their son. However, they did manage to put their thoughts together and recall the changes that happened to their son in the last two years, very serious changes, I should say. And they did admit uh, that they failed to pay enough attention to them. Очень доброжелательный. Потом, два года тому назад, у них появился новый имам. И после этого он начался меняться. Он абсолютно отделился от друзей. Начал совсем отделяться от семьи. Но меня пугало то, что он был совсем замкнутый. Вот последний... Характер изменился у него Характер совсем. изменился. Он никогда не, уже в последнее время не смотрел мне в глаза. Угу. Перестал называть меня матерью. Это больше всего меня убивало. The overall picture is an important one here as well. It's not the first time that young people in Russia have become radicalized by Islamic State. Not the first time. This is not the first mm -hmm. time 
Uh, we should all remember the case of Varvara Karulova. We reported sure. on that extensively this summer here on RT. She was just a, a common Orthodox Christian girl from Moscow. At some point, she abandoned her cross. She started wearing a hijab and changed her WhatsApp name from Varvara to Amina. And then she went on to Turkey, um, so allegedly to join the Islamic State. Her father was able to get her out of that country before she could do that. So that story had a happy ending. But we had another case with a young student, also a female student from St. Petersburg, who also changed her name, married a Syrian, and went to the Middle East to join the radicals, and nobody could do anything about it. The problem is that in the town where the people that we were talking about today are from, there's suspicion that that imam who was in charge of the local mosque for two years also uh, was able to radicalize six more families. And this is a, a very dire story. And what I'm going to do is travel there tomorrow Mm -hmm. and see if I can trace the imam's footsteps and also find out as much as I can from the locals. Let's see what we can get out of there. Yeah, as soon as it files back, we'll bring you that report too. So with Islamic State as the prominent global security headache right now, America's presidential hopefuls are putting their energies into deciding who to blame for the terror group's rise. Later, a Washington correspondent tells us how ISIL is now a fixture in the pre-election campaign.